online, on Radio Player, and on 106.6 FM. This is Wickham Sound, the Wickham Wanderers show. Welcome to what was due to be the final Wickham Wanderers show of the season, but we've been granted an extension, and uh, we're going into extra time. It's like watching a Wickham game. Uh, they go into 96 minutes, and uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, more on that in a few moments' time, but uh, plenty to uh, look at this season, uh, this season, uh, this week, uh, with Bob and myself, including your trip to Middlesbrough. Indeed, yes, uh, and what a trip it was. A 3 0 <laughs> victory. I didn't really see that coming. Uh, we will be hearing the thoughts as well from Gareth Ainsworth after the game and also David Stockdale. Plus, part two of Bob's chat with Rob Kuig. If you listened last week, you'll know uh, that he's a big fan of hot dogs. He can, <laughs> he can recommend the hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's a very big fan of hot dogs. Uh, we will be hearing uh, more about how the Kuhigs got into English football, because it was a little bit of a bumpy ride, um, and I think we are, are actually quite lucky that we did manage to, to get them, um, because... Uh, I think really uh, Rob was about to get on a plane and, and possibly like never come back and think right okay I'm done with, with English football uh, but luckily he happened to, to make a little stop off at Junction 4 um, of the M40 uh, and the rest as they say is history uh, so we will be hearing more of uh, that story later in the show that was handy cross yeah, very good, very good. So, <laughs> I'm impressed you've, you've come out with us some good cliches and now a handy cross link as well <laughs> and, we, and the show's only what one and a half minutes old I was going <laughs> to <laughs> oh, that bodes well for the next <laughs> 56 minutes, doesn't it? Um, uh, also, if you've been a fan, and um, it's hard not to be, of our ex-player interviews throughout uh, this season, and again, big thank you to uh, JDT and Anna Hutchinson of the Ex-Players Association. Uh, we've got a fantastic compilation of the majority of uh, former players and managers that we've spoken to uh, over the weeks to uh, to play some little excerpts of and it, it really I'm, I'm not just saying this but well, sort of am um, it, it really is a fantastic listen as a fan and you, you can you, you get a real flavour of the different stories from the different eras uh, from um, the club Really, we should have a competition um, sort of like um, if, if you can identify which ones didn't make the cut Yes <laughs> 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 Although it's not because it's not, for any, not for any reason. Well, yeah. I was just—it's it's the way you keep saying, like, the, like you know, mo- most of them anyway. Uh, yes, so well, yeah, there's not so all of them because see which ones, which ones didn't actually make it. <laughs> um, uh, but yes, I, I'm not quite sure what we could give away. But but no. uh, we we should have thought about this before the show began. Yeah, yeah, it's literally <laughs> literally just come to us. So <laughs> more planning. Yes. So uh, before we kick off, <clears throat> uh, to use more puns and cliches, um, we're back <laughs> next week, which is very exciting. We are indeed, yes. Um, so we had hoped uh, to speak to Gareth um, uh, and, and broadcast that tonight. Uh, however, as you probably have worked out, um, he is, is rather busy at the moment in contract negotiations. Um, and so uh, we hope to speak to him uh, either tomorrow or sometime next week, and we will be broadcasting that next Thursday. So we have been granted an extension to the Wick and Wanderer show, that, so there will be one more edition uh, next Thursday between 7 and 8. Very exciting. It's like the, play- well, it's like the through to the playoffs, isn't it? Indeed, <laughs> that's exactly how it feels. Yes, uh, and we'll also be playing some of the bits as well that um, didn't didn't necessarily go to plan, uh, which you you could say actually will take longer than an hour. But, <laughs> but, but there you go. No, lots to look forward to. So uh, let's let's cast our minds back to uh, lunchtime on Saturday. And as mentioned, uh, you were at Middlesbrough, and the, the sort of scene was quite strange in a way, in that mathematically uh, relegation wasn't confirmed. Uh, we still need thirteen, depending on who you talk to, fourteen uh, goals. But uh, but. It couldn't have gone too much better, really. It, it was incredible, um, and and sort of strangely, and I think I said this the the previous week. Um, you know, people were actually sort of like keeping up to date with what was going on elsewhere, as if it might actually happen. And clearly, the chances of it really happening were were, were nil. Um, but goodness me, you know, the, the fact that we were we were two nil up in the first half certainly, you know, no, nobody really saw that coming at all. Um, and it was a really exciting game. We we played some of the best football I have seen us play all season. Uh, just moving the ball around beautifully and uh, bear in mind as well it, it was a horrible horrible day uh, i know it was a horrible day down here it was it was really really grim even the locals were saying how cold and how horrible the weather was um on saturday up in middlesbrough um you know the pitch must have been saturated but we were moving the ball around um as as if it was on sort of like astroturf it was you know it was really really something to to behold we played so so well um and 
I can't even really say to you that Middlesbrough's players look like they were on the beach for a start. You know, this is a, a Neil Warnock side and you don't feel that he would have allowed that anyway. Um, defensively, I will say that they, they were slightly all over the shop, but actually the, the rest of them did play well uh, but we completely deserved our three nil victory um and you know and and it is so true uh, that it's been said so many times that you know if if only maybe we could have started the season a bit later not had those first seven games the form that we have been in uh you know would have probably seen us quite comfortably clear because this this is definitely now a team that can compete quite comfortably in the championship and something else which made it uh, even more exciting was something that Rob touched on uh, in your chat with him last week as well, which we had part one of, was the as-it-stands table, because that, that changed quite a bit. <laughs> it's changed so many times uh, during the game. Um, and as I say, again, you know, it was, it, it was exciting to watch, even though you knew that actually, yes, we, we were still going to finish below that line. Um, I, I, and I'm sure so many other people really were just so, so desperate to see us actually not finish 24th. A- and really, I was, I was keen as well to see us actually finish above another club that had not had a points deduction because I felt that, you know, if we'd finished above Sheffield Wednesday, people would have always then said, Oh, well, you know, uh, if they hadn't had their points deducted etc cetera, etc cetera. uh so the fact that we managed to then finish above rotherham as well was was you know was truly something it was absolutely brilliant um and you know it just what what a fantastic sort of 90 minutes just the number of times that actually the positions changed the ridiculous game that was going on between derby and sheffield wednesday uh where you know the lead changed several times the fact that rotherham you know and i, I to be honest you know i do feel sorry for rotherham the fact that they took the lead against cardiff and you know basically held it for you know right until the very end when Cardiff then got their equaliser. Um, uh, the, there's part of me that really would have liked to have seen Rotherham survive, um, but then at the same time, there's another part looking ahead to next season to think, well, you know, we we possibly don't need both Derby and Sheffield Wednesday in League One. Um, however, of course, uh, the the way things are at the minute, you you never know who we might actually be getting in League One or whether we'll be in League One at all next season. No, watch this space uh, quite literally. And something else which made it quite exciting, I was following um, on social media because I was on my way to work, but it was just the kind of I don't know, don't know if this was felt on the ground as well, but the sort of belief even going one nil up and you just thought oh, uh, people were actually saying you know, 12, only 12 more to go and it was, yeah. it was a real sense that oh, th- maybe this will be on now well, and, and that's what I mean. It, it was just incredible that actually you, you did sort of start to believe um, you know and, and the, we, we played like that as well that actually we did have quite a few chances during the game um, and so yes, you know uh, clearly, you know, 14 nil probably wasn't ever going to happen but even so you know, the, the fact that we managed to get three at Middlesbrough, you, you definitely would not have predicted that at the beginning of the season Still to come, we'll hear from David Stockdale who, as he'll, hear, as he'll say uh, didn't have too much to do at the Riverside but Bob spoke <laughs> to uh, Gareth after the game in years to come, when people look back at the championship season, they're going to see that Wickham Wanderers finished twenty second. Yeah, highest ever position, and I'm so proud of that, you know. And and like we've always said, um, we want it. We, we were going to finish in the highest position this club's ever been in, no matter what this season. But I'm so glad it's not bottom. It's not bottom of the league. You can't say that Wickham were bottom. They went down as bottom. No chance. We almost did this, and. Uh, I know there's 46 games and I know people will be screaming at the radio saying yeah but you didn't do it well you come and tell that to the boys in that dressing room because they've given absolutely everything I'll take the relegation they deserve to stay in the league Um, we've done everything they've done everything I've asked Um, and if I've got it wrong a couple of times then yeah blame me but they are a great bunch and uh, I'm so proud to be the manager Um, can't wait for next season now really can't because we're like a steam tram at the moment we must be in the top six, seven form in the championship. We look like contenders rather than relegation candidates today, and uh, just can't wait to kick a ball in in, in League One, <laughs> the, the, the division we've been trying to get in for 20 years. <laughs> um, we're going into it now, so let's make a mark. We've got a brilliant team in the Kuigs behind behind me at the scenes, and and they're going to back me on signings I want. They're going to back me on trying to bring players in, and uh, just. <laughs> Absolutely ecstatic with the results there. I thought it was brilliant performance. Uh, and uh, thank you to everyone this season for your support. You've been nothing but brilliant, as always, since the day I took the, uh, the job back against Dagenham um, back in 2012. So uh, come a long way now. Still at the Riverside in this beautiful stadium, and we've just taken uh, a top 10 team 
um, to a three 0 defeat. Well, well, what was amazing was you, you nearly did the, you know, you, you could have done the 14-0. It, it, it didn't look like it was beyond you today. We had the chances, didn't we? But um, that would have been crazy, you know. Rob told me about Ajax done it once, 13-0. So to be spoke about in the same breath as Wickham, Ajax, and uh, that would have been incredible. But uh, no, listen, um, we always knew that was uh, that was probably fantasy world. Um, my fairy tale is always going to be Tokyo away, you know, when we stayed in the football league. But like I say, it was. Uh, it was an awesome performance today and I can't wait to start League One and see where we can finish next year. Is that anything that we can read into the fact that Matt Bloomfield came on for the very last couple of minutes? Was was that his last performance maybe in a Wickham shirt? <laughs> Do you know what? That 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 will be spoke about in the summer. He's got a lot to offer. I played to us 43 actually. I played in the checker trade. I definitely played to us 40. He's only 37. So with me in charge, anyone's got a chance right up to the age of 40, 41. And, uh, and Matt's been an absolute legend at this club and if that is the final championship game we have for a few years I wanted him to be involved in it because we won't be here for people like him like Akin Fenway like Darius Charles those people who, who really have gone through the pain barriers for me and uh, and then we've got this new crop now coming through and they're unbelievable you know and, and people like Curtis Thompson who, who was you know just going into the non-leagues with Notts County yeah. wow it, I mean just stories like that Alex Samuel and people like that just it's just phenomenal that half of the team at the end there had played in League 2 with me um, that's a proud thing for me to say I'm proud for me to say and uh, I can't wait to be back next year and those players as well have not looked at all out of place this season absolutely not they've grown and grown we've worked hard and uh, we're a great bunch do you know what this game's about people this game's about moments uh, it's never about money um, and I told them that before the game I said it's moments and people and you've got a fantastic moment today and you're with some great people go and enjoy that game and they certainly did yeah well I just want to say we've had lots of comments this season at Wickham Sound from people saying how proud they are I've, I've heard that as well just mm. today people saying you know just incredible never expected to come to Middlesbrough and win 3 now. <laughs> so do pass that on to all of the players and to you as well you know thank you very much I know you say it often to me how proud yeah. of the boys you are absolutely so we're all very proud of you and the boys as well thank you so much everyone and uh, like I say very very proud Wickham manager and uh, always will be you do get quite a glowing feeling after listening to that yeah, uh, absolutely, uh, and almost slightly emotional. And Gareth looked a bit emotional, and I felt a bit emotional. Um, you know, it was just, just you know, a, a wonderful achievement for you know. Yes, I know people could be listening to this just thinking, "Well, what are they going on about?" They they got relegated, they finished twenty second, but twenty second in the championship. Uh, you know, if if you'd said that to someone travelling down to Torquay, uh, you know, all those years ago, uh, they they would not have believed you that we would end up finishing twenty second in the championship a few years later, um, and. You know, and and so so narrowly, um, you know, the, the being relegated, we nearly nearly avoided it, e- even though for for a lot of the season, it you know, it didn't look possible at all. And really good news, which emerged on that day as well, was that uh, David Stockdale signed for another year. Uh, he spoke to Bob after the game as well. What a fantastic way to win the season! I know that we've been relegated, yeah. but three 0 at the Riverside. I said, look, lads, smile the way through the whole game. And enjoy and express yourself, and that's exactly what they went and did. I just basically stood there for 93 minutes and watched an exhibition. And um, the people that wrote us off, yeah, they might have the laugh that, yeah, I told you you were down, but no one would ever guess this. I think we was on 19 points at, yeah. at one point, and uh, to get to 43 and and uh, push a few people and have a few nail biting moments and. Um, so yeah, we the gaffer just talks about every day, what's next, what's next, and speaking to the hierarchy and Rob and Pete and the gaffer, and I'm so excited. And um, fantastic, you signed for another year. Yeah, it, oh, like I said, it it, it won't. There's no real, uh, you know, when you say you fit in somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just fit in here. This is my my character, and that it, they let me be. Everyone be who they are, and look. When it comes down to a game, you, you do the right things, and um, that is the gaffer and, and the hierarchy let you do it. Um, nearly had uh, Rob up singing last night, but the gaffer gaffer told me I wasn't allowed to tell. Him. Oh, oh no, that, you know. Yeah, look, there's always a line, and I like to cross it quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I, 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 there's no doubt that I think Rob would have sung as well. But then what what would he have sung? Do you think? Uh, it'd have been some bar bar special or something. <laughs> 
<laughs> Definitely. Yeah. What was it like this afternoon standing out there when it was absolutely pouring on you um, and just 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 watching the three goal, you know three nil against against the middle? I know it wasn't the fourteen that we needed, but I'm the Leeds lad. This is normal. You know, we came up here new on. It's a nice weather. I said it's just brilliant. <laughs> Not great for uh, trying to keep your gloves dry, but luckily the lads did brilliantly and didn't have to do much. No, I mean it was you know it was fantastic. It's been fantastic all season. You've been fantastic as well yeah. since you've come in. Um, you know we've had so many people at Wickham Stand who've been telling us you know just how proud you know I know he says it all the time yeah. how proud they are of of all of the lads. I am, um, and every lad will tell you the same. The fact that we're in there, not down, we're not we're not bitter. We learn a lot, and if we can use that as a jumping board for the whole club and the things that are coming on the the business side of the club and to have owners that are, are, are not in it to just throw money like I um, to put a proper infrastructure and to help the gaffer and have, have this sort of mantra and as you know Pete's already wonderfully uh, eccentric so he goes exactly how we want him um, and it's great it's a great atmosphere and nobody's down I mean look we're good that we're, we've been relegated but we know the reasons why and we, we, we will learn really interesting insight into the sort of the dressing room there as well and, and how together all the players are definitely uh, and you know and you could tell that actually the whole place was buzzing um, after the game even though they had been relegated and you know and that is Wickham Wanderers um, and I, I've said it to you quite a lot of times actually I'm always amazed that particularly actually the games that Wickham lose Gareth is always coming out so positive it, you know he's almost bouncing around sort of like when he's, he's chatting to you um, and you know and that really really comes across that he's clearly just trying to bring the team up actually when when they haven't done very well when they have done well he just lets them get on with it and it must be so easy as well to look at the, the what ifs throughout the season as well and just oh, think oh if yes. only I know, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only fan who's who's done this sort of like since Saturday, but I mean, particularly with regards to Derby County um, and thinking back to the two games against them, um, Gareth McCleary, as I recall, then hitting the, the bar um, at um, uh, Pride Park quite late on um, when it was one all. And you just think, oh, you know, if only. Um, and then, of course, the game at Adams Park, which, you know, they, they cruelly snatched a 2-1 victory uh, right at the very end. I think it was the seventh minute of injury time when they won a free kick, um, which uh, uh, they scored. And you just think, oh, if, you know, if only that, that hadn't happened, if only the referee had blown up slightly before then, um, then, you know, clearly it would have been a completely, completely different story. And it's easy to say throughout the season, but you know, refereeing decisions or chances created or, or, or attempts just only just missed, and, and it, you can look at those and, and look at the points tally, and we could be, you know, even just obviously just one point better off would have been. Yeah, I, I, and totally, that is so true. And I did think that on Saturday that actually, you know, it, it's a, a sort of a massive learning thing for for particularly say, you know, people who are just getting into football, um, you know, kids who who, who are, are are playing for the first time. That actually, you know, it every game does absolutely matter 100 percent. it's not just those games at the end of the season um and i particularly thought it when rotherham were actually outside of the relegation zone um and again uh, just thinking goodness me all the way back to the opening day at adams park where you know they they were really really fortunate to, to go away with a one nil win having scored right at the very end i remember daryl horgan hitting the post uh, after four minutes if that had gone in you know that it would have been a completely different game had we even managed to hang on for the draw again you know the, the, the whole way that maybe the season panned out would have been completely different. So, yeah, you know, play to the whistle, play for 90 minutes, and, and every game counts. It's not just the 46th game. You know, sometimes, yes, even the very first game, uh, if you, you know, you nearly scored, things might have changed if you actually had score with regards to goal difference, with regards to, to points gained. So much seems to come and go in stoppage time as well, doesn't it? Oh, it really does. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, as I say, I think we can all sit there and we can all look back and, and basically have the, the sliding doors moment of thinking if that had happened and if that hadn't have happened. Uh, and you do slightly drive yourself insane. But that's what being a football fan is all about, really. Absolutely. Still to come on what is now, once again, the penultimate Wickham Wanderers show <laughs> of the season. Uh, part two of uh, Bob's chat with Rob Kiwik, the Wickham Wanderers chairman. That's to come. Uh, we'll take a bit of a look as well at uh, some of the contracts 
dates uh, as well that uh, have been agreed. Who's coming? Uh, who's going, rather? And who's staying? <laughs> and who's coming? Uh, <laughs> Are you coming or going? It's a revolving door. They're not sliding doors. Uh, and also got a fantastic look at back in a few moments' time uh, with uh, some of our player interview pre uh, sorry post player pre player interviews before they were players. This is Wickham Sound. <laughs> Still to come on the penultimate Wickham Wanderer show of the season, we'll be uh, looking back at uh, when Bob, uh, Luke and I and social media uh, predicted where we thought Wickham would um, would finish in the table. We were all very optimistic, weren't we, about where it would be? Yeah, which was good. You know, we, we should be. We're Wickham Wanderers fans. We, we you know, we're, we're positive. Absolutely. Last half on. <laughs> I think the that. start of the season as well. Is, that's that's the time to be to be um, yeah. optimistic. Yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, you you've got to be a pretty pessimistic fan <laughs> really to, to be sitting there saying, "Well, you know, I think we'll probably get relegated." But first, you know, you, even when you're like us, you exactly, know, you, you're not going to say that. No, no. <laughs> even with poor predictions, <laughs> but first, you know, at, at the very least, you say twenty first, which I know that we didn't necessarily say, but that that's what you'd go for, isn't it? Absolutely. But first. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> you got any more? Oh, that's it. Oh, fantastic. Um, <laughs> you're welcome to contribute any time. Um, but which first... the goody? <laughs> a, an in-joke from a few weeks ago, which you've just tuned in. We'll see about. Um, one of the highlights of the season, I think, is, is easy to say, is that uh, we've been lucky enough to speak to uh, many uh, ex-players, um, former managers as well, and even the former physio, and uh, just to find out a bit about their memories of their time at the club, what they're doing now, um, sort of highlights, if you like, how they got to be uh, at the club, and uh, we've put together, uh, thanks to producer Luke, um, mainly, uh, a, a sort of montage. I made that sound really French, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> a montage. It might be a French word, I might be right. Um, <laughs> montage um, of uh, some of our sort of favourites, if you like. Enjoy. I literally come back from having a, a really serious accident at work at the time and went through the process of doing rehab and the, the club were fantastic with me for, the, for that. And uh, I think he'd taken the chaps over to, um, to Henlow Grange, I think, for a, sort of a bit of a chill-out day and what have you. And um, he invited me over and called me up and said, I want to offer you a contract. So I was like, wow, that's amazing. So that was one of my, my school schoolboy dreams realised at the you know, ripe old age of whatever it was then, 30 or 32, 33, and uh, it took me about uh, three or four seconds to say, yeah, thanks very much, yeah. You know, I, I remember the first game I played for Wickham in the first team, I was playing against the then England fullback, and I gave him a roast in. <laughs> and, you know, everything seemed to just happen. Good things happened, and... Uh, I then, as you probably know, stayed playing for Wickham for 15-odd years and played 520-odd games for them. So, you know, it was a great time there. Great team, great club. Brian Lee at the time, the manager, he knew Jack Charlton and he, he, he knew the football, the standard and everything, and he said to us, I think, he, I think it was a bit of a a contract really because he said to us as good as you are because we did have a good team there's no question you'll get a spanking against these because these are no nonsense professional side but of course that, all that did really with the characters that we had in air so I would spur us on really if anything and uh, we really should have won eh? and I can remember when we got back to Wickham after the match we stopped at the cricket ground on the way in from London and the supporters towed the coach by hand from there to the Red Lion in the High Street. And in the High Street, there was the most enormous crowd. And, I, you know, I was lucky enough being part of the, of the squad, as it were. And we went up on the balcony of the old Red Lion and faced all the crowd who were cheering as though we'd won the match comfortably. But it was such an experience that I shall never, ever forget. The game when uh, Cuz got sent off for his uh, two-foot tackle, you know, we'd, we'd come in half-time and I think he'd been sent off like five, ten minutes before and he was in the shower, showered up, all soaked up, and O'Neill just came in and dragged him out by his ear and just threw him into the, uh, in, into the tunnel area. That was, uh, that was hilarious. Blessing pro Cuzzo, but for me, that, you know, I didn't even know what might said half time. I was just curled up in the corner trying, yeah, trying to stop him seeing me laughing. 
there was a fantastic camaraderie. I know it's an overused word, but it really was. It was uh, evocative of the team. They were willing to fight for each other the whole time. But there was an enjoyment during our training sessions as well. And we, I mean, we weren't blessed with any great training ground or anything like this here. We we tried different places. We finally settled up at Homer Green for a while where there was a, 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 a man and his wife looked after us very, very well. And they were terrific to us. And um, after training, the buns and the sandwiches would come out. We just, it was, honestly, it really was a super, super time for us. And, and, and of course, with the results going well on the pitch, that helps immensely. And uh, I, th- I look back on that there with really fond memories. In the first season, we got through to the last, in the last 16 of the Amateur Cup, which, of course, was always the big thing in those days. We played Marine Crosby, a team from Liverpool, at Lopes Park, a crowd of 12,000. Lucky enough, we, we beat Marine and then had um, Barnet away in the quarterfinals of the Amateur Cup with, with 11,000. You've got to remember that this was shortly after the war when there weren't many cars around. They'd been starved of sport during all the war years. And um, there's a huge appetite for sport, but because people didn't have cars, they, you either travelled to London to see Arsenal or Chelsea or someone, or you stopped in Wickham and watched the local team. Your goal then is, is, is to actually play in an FA Trophy final, and, and, and I was lucky enough to play in two, as, as were some of the other players. And if you take the 19, you know, the year we won the, we won the trophy in the league in the same year, you know, we also won the Champion Shield three years on the trot, and we got. And that year, we got beat in the Drinkwise um, final as well. So, you know, we 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 had a, we won three out of four trophies at non-league level that you can win. But arguably, we were the. I was part of probably the best non-league team in the country. So, you know, they were great times. We played against Tottenham in a, in a friendly when they had an unbelievable side out. And Glenn Hoddle, Ozzy Ardiles, Ricky Villier, yeah, they were really a first class team. And that was a year, I think, that Clive Allen scored 45 goals or something in the old first division. So, yeah, it was quite an experience. But, yeah, I spent my whole afternoon, I think, backpedalling for Glenn Hoddle's little chips over the top because he didn't chip anything on, onto your head. He sent a half. He chipped everything just over your shoulder or just over the back where you couldn't reach it. He was unbelievable, really. His, his skill level was fantastic. It was very strange. That was my second game, I think. I saw uh, about 10 people wearing wigs and I just couldn't believe it. I think my, my hair was, uh, at, the, at that time, was very, very distinct and um, very unique. So people, yeah, I used to, I used to get called all sorts of things every time we play away, but I just took it as, a, as banter and then the wig of us really took it to uh, their heart and then, yeah, they started selling some wigs in the club shop. <laughs> John was, was fully aware of my deficiencies but he, he, he looked at my strengths and said okay what can I get out of this of, the, of this kid what can he bring to the to the to the team and that's a, a fantastic quality in, in a manager and um, you know it's I was able to do well and the, the team was able to do well most importantly I was top scorer for a few years but um, when you play with good players it does help they, they put good crosses in and make good chances for you and um, you know Obviously, I scored the first goal at Adams Park as well against Nottingham Forest. I think that was how long is that? Thirty years ago. <laughs> it's a long time ago now. So um, yeah, it was really pleasing. That, of course, is uh, really w- w- what, uh, uh, what my philosophy was at the the club. W- Wickham wanted to show people in Wickham first and foremost. And it's only when we can't find them in Wickham that we might go out to Marlow or Maidenhead. You know what I mean? That's that was my thinking and let's make it our club let's make it the town club but um, um, you, you get uh, I mean the grammar school obviously is rugby so that wasn't going to produce anything and the other schools were all in a mess, bit of a mess so we I was disappointed with the number of local players we had really I think the week before um, we lost 3-2 I didn't play in that game I had a virus for about four or five days during the week building up to the Sutton uh, home game and um, I came to the ground Martin said are you okay to play I said I'm okay David Jones and the doctor said oh, I don't think he should play because he's lost I lost half a stone and um, 
funny enough, I, I went in and watched the Grand National while the game was on because I, I was so devastated that I couldn't play. And um, but then I think played Woking during the week, drew nil nil, and then um, Martin changed the team completely because we lost at that game, and he thought he'd go for it. And um, we were so hyped up for this game. It was. I mean, Martin says to me now, he said it's in his top five games of all time since he's been a manager. And I think it, really, and he's you know he's quite genuine when he said it was in his top five games. That Sutton away game, which we won four nil, and. Um, I was very lucky to score um, two goals and I think go down and do uh, as one of the worst celebrations you've ever seen in football <laughs> as well. The resilience in that group, you know, how many replays we went through? I think two or three. I think Millwall, Grimsby and Wimbledon all went to a, wil- a replay during that. And then to play Leicester, beat them away. And of course to lose against Liverpool, but in a very respectable fashion, if there is such a thing when you lose, um, it just was... It, well, it was the moment for me of a, as a footballer outside of, you know, it, and I still put this above playing for my country, playing for my country being the next big thing. But it, those are the two peak moments in my soccer playing career. It was uh, very exciting. You know, I mean, 90-odd thousand uh, packed house. Uh, wonderful. Coming up the tunnel was uh, incredible. You come out in, you know, through the opening and onto the pitch, and the roar was uh, something to behold. It was uh, amazing. Wonderful memories. This letter arrived from the surgeon, and it was all typed as they officially are. And at the bottom, there's a very big, bold ink signature, and underneath it said, What a remarkable recovery. What a remarkable man. And I think that just summarises the types of people that worked and played for Wickham Wanderers. I remember Brian Lee took me to one side and he said, remember, it's not quantity, it's your quality of life. And basically he said, if I joined Wickham, I would be an England amateur international. And um, true to his word, within um, a couple of months of signing for Wickham, I'd won my first amateur international cap. I think we played it at Wickham, actually. It was against Republic of Ireland, I think. And then I was managed, uh, was able um, to get a goal with about five minutes to go. And and it was incredible, you know, the whole end full with Wickham fans, scarves, banners, mums, dads. You know, it just went crazy. The whole end went just ballistic and... Uh, it was a fantastic feeling and I hoped it wasn't just going to be that I just we were all like desperate to to keep that cut run going and even if we could have taken it to extra time or penalties or something just to because we enjoyed thoroughly the um, the run the trip the um, the adrenaline filled sort of journey that it was obviously that Barry one sticks out because it was it was my first senior hat trick the, the Chelsea at home game where we drew one all and I, and I managed to score Charlton away where we won 1-0 would was, was, was be one that, that sort of stuck in my mind and, and Fulham away where I think we won 2-1 and I, and I was fortunate enough to score again We were able then to see the game through and the atmosphere afterwards you know with the, the home supporters was fantastic and I think everybody that was you know associated or involved in that game will, will never forget it Certainly, the, that Wickham team was a very, very strong team, but probably no stronger than Brian Lee's teams all across that era. It's just that you've got to, you've got to give yourself the opportunity of being able to play in something like a, an FA Cup game or a, you know, a Amateur Cup final or whatever to see if, if uh, you can meet those expectations. Alan Phillips, rounding things off, who uh, was the captain, of course, of the FA Cup third round team who played against Middlesbrough, speaking ahead of the uh, final game of the championship season against... Middlesbrough. <laughs> <laughs> it was really fantastic to hear that. That was a great listen as a fan, obviously, as, as someone who did a lot of interviews as well. But um, some really great memories. Obviously, I think speaking to Martin O'Neill has to be uh, my favourite. Mark West is brilliant to hear from. Um, Sergio Torres was great. Uh, Mark Rogers really enjoyed as well. And also Keith Ryan uh, were all highlights. But also fantastic to hear from some of the older players as well. 
Yeah, and, and thank you so much, as, as you've already said, uh, to the Expos Association, because we couldn't have done any of that without them. Um, just brilliant. Uh, Sergio Torres, definitely, that, that was uh, a favourite. Um, the, the Martin O'Neill bit, I'd forgotten, you know, I'd forgotten how good the Martin O'Neill one was already, um, but just the fact that he was then talking about the, you know, the couple who used to be near the training <laughs> ground, um, who then were, were bought out the buns. And it was just like, you know, you can see how much football has changed in, in a relatively short time um, that I'm sure that, you know, if if somebody bought buns to the training ground now, they would probably be quite politely shown the door. <laughs> Bearing in mind the training grounds have a book here, they probably from the garden centre. They could have brought across some buns, probably from there. <laughs> yes, you know, it's one of the planes flew over. They could drop some buns in. Hope no one notices. No, I really enjoyed having the ex-players and uh, indeed managers and physio uh, on as well. And uh, there'll be more uh, more of that next season as well. This is Wickham Sound. <laughs> final part of what was going to be the final Wickham Wanderer show of the season but we're back next week uh, with uh, uh, with more from the manager and plus there's some there's some moments where, where <laughs> some, what you might term comedy moments yes uh, uh, yes and things like lawnmowers is going off in the background and uh, parts of stadiums falling parts down of stadiums falling down yeah that was that was a particular highlight uh, but anyway it is time now to hear uh, the second part of my interview with chairman Rob Puhig. Um now I spoke to him last week uh, so uh, the season obviously was still ongoing so so he refers to the season a couple of times as if it is still ongoing um, and obviously there is no mention uh, with regards to the points deduction that Derby County may or may not suffer um, with regards to the EFL financial regulations. Why an interest in, in English football, Rob? Well, I guess it stems from sort of a parapathetic a- approach to life. I like to do various things. I love events. Start there. In the mid-90s, I had gotten divorced. I was trying a lawsuit in in San Diego, and if you get a chance to try a case in San Diego, let me recommend it to you. But I was coming back and forth to New Orleans every other weekend, and on those alternative weekends, I started going to Major League Baseball. First in San Diego, pretty nice. Second two weeks, I went to the Los Angeles Angels in Anaheim. Nice. Third weekend, I went on a Saturday afternoon to the Los Angeles Dodgers and Dodgers Stadium, 60,000 people, 45,000 of whom were the most beautiful women I had ever seen in my life. I'm single. I said, I got to get me one of these. (laughs) And so, seriously, I just, I love events and I love putting things on for people and I like to have them have a good time. That's probably the New Orleanian in me. Uh, My mom and, and, and dad were like that. So, uh, And I like the business component. In minor league baseball, I set out to prove that you could bring minor league baseball to New Orleans. We had not had it in 30 years. Build a stadium that was truly baseball-centric but could do other things. Um, We did that. We uh, uh, We built it into... One of the four or five most successful teams in America, we won, I was going to say on the pitch, y'all have got me. Uh, <laughs> That's impressive. <though. laughs> if, we could, if, if we've got you speaking the English way around, then that is very good. We've got you. Yeah, But we won, we won the, uh, the world championship in baseball. And for me, we won the championship in that four out of, of when I owned it, we were almost always in the top five in attendance in all of minor league baseball. Uh, we got to do some fun things with our stadium. I put in the first swimming pool of any stadium in America uh, for baseball. So uh, that was good, and I owned them until 2002, 2003, somewhere in there. And, and the time had come, and I got out of it, and we got into doing other things. Katrina hit. Um, and one day at Thanksgiving, my brother and nephew, Pete, who's a world-famous celebrity here in uh, High Wycombe, uh, but my brother Kevin and Pete, big, big Liverpool fans. Kevin has been flying over to England to watch Liverpool for 35 years. Uh, I had never seen a game. I, I had owned a minor league soccer team in the States. It did pretty well, but I was not that involved in it other than the ownership and, and frankly, the uh, financial part. They said, why don't you buy a team over here? I said, well, I'll do that. So, but, you know, why not? It's Thanksgiving. I had had maybe more than one glass of wine. Uh, so I wrote to four or five teams, and I got back responses anywhere from no response to thanks for the interest, but we're not, to 
uh, employment, the guy who's turned out to be a friend of mine now, oh, Simon Hazlitt said, oh, I just did it. <laughs> You're too late. And the Yeovil guy said, nothing, uh, but I met a, a guy, Mark Palmer, through that, and he said, well, look, when you come to England next time, let's at least sit and talk about what you're trying to do. So my wife and I and two couples that are very good friends of ours came over here for the Chelsea Flower Show. And we went to that, and I had agreed to meet with Palmer. When we walked out, and I brought with me one of the guys who has invested with me in virtually everything I've done for 30 years. We walked out, out of that, and he said, I'll tell you one thing. I'm not doing it. It's a fool's game. You can't make any money. These people, all they want to do is sell it to the next guy. And I said, well, I don't know. I think I might. He says, well, just don't put my name on anything. So we had a good laugh, but I was very interested. By coincidence, the next day, uh, we drove up to Oxford to look at the team. And my buddy Dick said, well, y'all go. I'm not going. There's nothing in Oxford for me. but one of the, uh, the girls on the trip, she it was a high executive for Madison Square Garden. So she and I toured, Missy and her husband wandered around Oxford while she and I toured the uh, Kazam Stadium. And we finished and we had a nice meeting with the folks there. And she turned to me and she said, if I was you, I wouldn't do it. I said, why not? She said, single worst lease I've ever seen in my life. And I said, okay, good enough for me. And I thought it was done. Uh, out of the blue, Mark Palmer called me and said, how about Yeovil? I looked at it. It was intriguing. I had no idea where it was. I went over. We got interested in it. I thought there was huge potential there for a variety of reasons. Uh, we lent them some money to help them stabilize. Uh, Pete came over and began the due diligence on it. I, I thought we, were, we signed an agreement. I thought we were ready to go, and at the last minute they pulled out of it. I, to this day, have no clue what happened. Both John Fry and and uh, Norman are friends, to as far as I know, but they didn't want to do the deal, so I thought I was totally out. I went home. I called Chris Boyce, our lawyer, and I said, Hey, Chris, can I get my money back? He said, Yeah, you'll probably get it, and I did. In the meantime, Palmer calls me up and says, why don't you come over and look at some other clubs? I said, I, you know, I've been burnt now. Uh, he said, now give it one more weekend. You, you've gotten this far. So I flew over. He sent me up to Grimsby. <laughs> did, you, uh, did you have the fish and chips? <laughs> yeah, they had a little fish and chips. But I called my wife and I said, pretty sure we're not buying this one because <laughs> I want to stay married. I talked to the guy, believe it or not, at Burry complete idiot. I could not get him to tell me a straight story. And I think what people probably have learned about me is that as friendly as I may be, I'm a pretty much X and Y sort of guy. Tell me what the deal is, and I'll tell you yes or no. If you just want to tell me your life story and about why we're going to ultimately get to X, I got no time for you. So we got out of that, and I was thinking I'm done. I'm driving back to Heathrow. Mark calls me and says, how about Wickham? I said, Mark, take this the right way. I have no clue where it is. He says, it's perfect. It's on the way to the to Heathrow. Trevor Stroud will meet you and me. And so I came here. Uh, Trevor really sold Wickham. Plus, the place sells itself. And so we had a conversation. I told him I was interested. I told him what I would do. I got on the plane once again thinking, well, I probably got a chance at this. Got home three days later, they said, we've picked somebody else. And I can remember I wrote to him and I said, did not realize it was a competition. If you are interested in me, I will remain interested for a little bit, but I'm not changing my approach. And about a week or two later, he called me up and said, look, we do have a real interest in you are you still interested? And I said, I am. I can be there tomorrow. And I think that impressed him when I showed up less than 24 hours later from New Orleans. I met with them, uh, the board and Trevor, and we finished. And he said, well, I'll let you know. And I want to say it was that night or the next day. He said, yeah, we're willing to do the deal. Can you help us out now? (laughs) I said, what do you need? 
<laughs> said half a million pounds. When do you need it? Tomorrow. Okay. Uh, and so we did. I mean, it took maybe 48 hours to get the paperwork sorted. So I got excited by it, and I told Pete, I said, Pete, never leave me alone again. <laughs> <laughs> and I got him to come over. Missy came over. I had a conversation before that with Gareth where we were very direct with each other. What do you need? I said, I do not want to be throwing up in April worried about getting relegated. Uh, he told me, um, I said, I will do that for you. We made that commitment. We came over. We entered into, uh, again, Boyce and, and the lawyers for the trust began their negotiations. We knew that we had to get an approval from everybody, 75%. And so we just went about our business. So here I am. And did you expect to get that approval? Oh, yeah. Uh, look, I part of my background is doing politics. Uh, I have not been successful as a candidate, but I am probably the single most successful campaign manager you'll meet. Uh, and the only reason I don't think I was successful as a candidate, in addition to my personal flaws, is my philosophy and where I live are two radically different places. So, And so looking back on it now, and I appreciate that, that we had an unplanned pandemic in the middle of it, how, how has it been so far? Has it lived up to your expectations? It has been a wild ride. We had more fun between that June 15th or thereabouts when we first put up money and when I came to see the the Doncaster game after we had finally closed February 21st, 22nd, then you can imagine. Missy was gotten to know everybody. The ladies loved her. The guys loved her. I loved everybody. Pete, of course, became a folk hero almost overnight. Uh, and so everything was going great. And then when the when the pandemic hit, uh, it radically changed everything. You know, you, you began to put things in perspective. Owning a club was fun. The club's great. But in terms of life and death, football never will be. For Pete, it has been brutal, to be honest. I don't think people understand that. He has been separated from his family almost a year and a half. He's got two boys, one 13, one 17, uh, at the time in their life when they need their dad, uh, and, and yet he, he kind of he's been home three times, I think, in, a, in 15 months. So that's been hard. Uh, the team was fabulous. Uh, they communicated with me both individually and as a group. The manager and his staff have been fabulous. I, we probably, Gareth and I, because I'm not one of these guys who goes to the training ground and hangs around, but as a result of this, he and I had to communicate in a way, and we did a lot. So we've gotten to know each other very well. The staff here did incredibly. It was a small staff to begin with. It became much smaller as a result of the pandemic. They they trudged on. Matt Cecil, who you know is our, uh, our media guy, all of those guys did fabulous. But there was a certain lack of connectivity, if that's the right word, being 4,500 miles away, you're cheering for him, you're watching iFollow or you're watching on ESPN. We had everybody at my house uh, wearing their mask when we were in the uh, playoffs. I would be lying if I said it's been the most fun time. But it has certainly been among the most satisfying of times because where we are today, compared to where we are when I first met Trevor as a club, I think a night and day. When we met the club, I want to, I don't know if this is right or not, or just what they tell me, but when you look at the financials, it was certainly looked like it. They were within days of administration, literally had run out of money. Uh, and they had a big note, several big notes come and do. Today, I don't think there are a handful of clubs that are in better economic shape than we are. In part, it's because of our management. In part, it's because we were very fortunate on some business interruption that Ian Kiesner had gotten before the pandemic, and we're one of probably less than 10 clubs that had it. Uh, we've got a good staff that put the claim together. Uh, we cut our costs where we could. We put a quality team on the field. We got very fortunate. We got into the championship. Uh, that brought economic good times as well. You know, the TV package, 
we didn't go out and do something. Gareth and I had a heart-to-heart about it. What are your options? And when we looked at it, you can go one of two ways. You can go spend big and try and clutch and hang on in the championship. The irony was is when we looked at who had done that, they didn't particularly fare any better than clubs that did not. What you really wanted to do, and I give Gareth credit for this, is you want to honor the people who got you there. And as the season goes on, you'll notice we have made certain changes, and and I hesitate to call them upgrades, but different types of players that fit into our style of play. And then, of course, we made a change in style and play, all of which I wouldn't say were premeditated, but certainly well thought out of. Uh, the club, I think, is in the... Is, is as good a shape as you can find. We are doing things now looking forward. Nobody has a clue. We are entertaining people knocking on the door wanting to use our stadium. And you say, why Adams Park? Well, for those fans who haven't had a chance to be here because it's not yet complete, we will have the, the most technologically advanced stadium out here. Every seat in the house will have great Internet connectivity, uh, we will have the uh, – you saw, if you watched on TV, the boards, or the perimeter boards. Those were rented from a uh, Premier League team. We're bringing in new boards that are state-of-the-art that will knock your socks off. Our scoreboard was inadequate. I was very displeased with the uh, vendor on that. That has been replaced and the new school board will be roughly, I want to say, 120% larger than the old one. So quite big then. Yeah, it will go from one stand to the other. You'll be able to sit in the top of the Frank Adams stand and watch it as you do television at home. Our, um, our audio system, for our music, you know, it's the home of rock and roll football. Yeah. You will not be able to turn it to 11, up to 11 in our stadium, because nobody would be able to handle the noise. These will be the finest speaker systems of any park of its size. Our food system, um, I said early days that I'm a guy who likes to go to a game, not because I necessarily enjoy the specific sport, but I love the event. Um, we, we've got a new chef in who's got new foods, drinks, and the like. Most importantly, you'll be able to order your food and drink instead of getting in the queue at halftime along with 9,000 other people. You will have gone on your on your iPhone or your smartphone and ordered your food. You'll just go to a pickup point, all done paperlessly. You'll pick up your food and drink, and off you go. And so that's wildly improved. Little things that I am fascinated with, and I don't know that anybody else is. You'll be able to come into our stadium ticketless every, every place. You, the fan experience will continue to be impressive. It, it's wild. It really is. And all of those things that you talk about, actually, uh, and you say possibly it's only you that's interested, but all of those things matter. And if you get in that queue at half time and you still haven't got served by the time that the team are out in the second half, that that's really annoying, especially if you miss a goal. I learned that, incidentally, and you, you're an American baseball fan. In American baseball, we when we built our stadium, you were able to watch the action as you were buying your hot dog because you're going to be there three hours. And, and baseball's a little bit like soccer and that when something happens all of a sudden it happens but they had the big jumbo screen where you could watch it happen again nobody got too hung up about it here you don't want to miss a moment and so we have to cater to our fan base to make sure that when the football is on they can be on I always think of it that actually baseball and cricket are very similar like that in that actually it doesn't matter if you miss a bit of the action whereas actually our two football codes are exactly the same you you go go along you want to watch the whole thing absolutely that is ex- that's probably the thing that makes them most similar yeah. is that you don't want to miss a moment of it great to uh, look forward to next season as well hearing from Rob of course this week as well uh, the the difficult decision I'm sure for a manager with the, the contracts and saying who's who's staying and who's going and I guess obviously it's stand out uh, with Ryan Alsop and uh, Darius Charles as well. Yes, indeed. It's always a, a, a sad um, notification to get on the club website, isn't it? Yes, Ryan Alsop, Cameron Yates, Giles Phillips, Darius Charles, and uh, um, Ad- Adron Giorgio's contracts are not to be renewed. However, the club has exercised its option to extend the contracts of Curtis Anderson, Malchi Linton, and 
Anis Mameti for a further year and also James Clark for six months. Uh, the club say that discussions are ongoing with the future of other players, including Adebayo Akinfenwa. Um, all of the loanees have now returned to their parent clubs and the club say that they thank all the departing players for their efforts. But as you say, um, you know, definitely very sad to, to see uh, Ryan Alsop um, and also Darius Charles leave, who've been fantastic servants of the chairboys. Producer Luke joins us. Hello. From, from, from uh, uh, memories of the... Was it the must have been the first show. The first week first you show. made your predictions, and I, I have did. them in reverse order. <laughs> Colin, you lost. Uh, you said... Lost is strong. 15th place. Oh, I thought I said 14th. Why well, not too bad. No. Uh, somebody called Luke Ooh. said 16th place. Oh, getting warmer. I beat you, that's all that matters. <laughs> uh, uh, and then, sort of a joint first, because social media uh, said 13th to 21st place, and Bob... You said 17th place, so congratulations, yeah, okay. Bob, and social media. Thank you very much. And that, that's know, the best you've done for a prediction this season. <laughs> <It is, laughs> absolutely. I'm finally, I, I'm, well done, I'm Bob. the closest. Hooray! Well, well done to you, I think. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm an optimist, you're a realist. Well done. Well, yeah, yes, you know. I, I'm a, a real optimist. <laughs> <laughs> or something. <laughs> uh, join us next week for what will be. Sure. <laughs> it will. <laughs> Potentially. They, well, unless uh, something enormous happens, you know. If, if Derby do get their points deduction or something, maybe we'll go We'll be going it. long into the summer. Indeed, yes. We are, well, that's the thing with that. I think it's just going to go and go and go, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Uh, join us next week and possibly the week after uh, the Wickham Warner Show here at Wickham Sound.